So let me start off by reminding people that the overall title of this satellite symposium is Are Postoperative Opioids Obsolete? We came up with this title about a year and a half ago, at which time it seemed to be more in the keeping of the traditional anesthesia acute pain trajectory where concerns such as respiratory depression that you'll hear about from Pam McIntyre and other concerns are paramount. But in the last couple of years, there's been a whole other series of things happen. Just for your amusement though, I wanted to show you that when I look back at our SIG meeting in 2012 in the line, in the section that I gave, along with the other people I, I mentioned as presenting, I thought that we could ask quo vadis, which is Latin for where are we headed? with regard to multimodal analgesia. So this next slide was actually a slide shown in 2012. The only change thing I highlighted today is because today really meant 2012. And it started with the idea that morphine sparing has been shown in controlled trials of a variety of interventions for about 50 years. Starting with NSAIDs for pharmacotherapy, at least in the 60s, if not sooner. By, in this case, I cited Ray Hood from New York. And behavioral therapy, education, earliest paper I was aware of was by Egbert Petit et al. in 1964, where patients were provided with information as to what would befall them. At that point, the focus was on respiratory depression from opioids and other opioid adverse events like nausea, vomiting, GI dysfunction, and so on were also costly and delayed recovery. So I posed the question, should the default be zero post-op opioid? Well, going back 25 years ago to the first federal guideline, I can tell you that on a personal level, when we were involved with these guidelines, this was also the same thing that, uh, at least in our NSAID case, there was a potentiating effect resulting in opioid sparing. So opioid sparing and reduction is very much on the scene. This is a copy of the cover of the third edition of what now has an outstanding fourth edition, namely the Australian and New Zealand College of Anesthetists and Faculty of Pain Medicine, Acute Pain Management Scientific Evidence. Even then in 2010, there were many choices given for multimodal therapy. In 2011, the U.S. Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation was concerned that clinically significant drug-induced respiratory depression, whether it be oxygenation or ventilation, remained a serious risk post-op and continued to be associated with significant morbidity and mortality since this group first addressed it five years before that. Therefore, they recommended that multimodal analgesia techniques needed to be used more often to decrease opioid use. Henry Kellett has been speaking about this topic for years and of the hundreds of things that he's written and we could cite. He wrote in 2004, there's a need for studies in which analgesics previously demonstrated to have opioid sparing effects are combined to potentially enhance opioid sparing. So just to remind you, this is the cartoon we often conceptualize as post-operative pain intensity, you have some baseline that's not perfectly constant, but it's in a relatively small zone. And then there are breakthrough episodes. So if we could just lower the entire graph of pain intensity by one or two notches per modality, we would do that. Recently, my wife, who is assisting me in making this whole thing uh, hold together, uh, were in Maine. and. I can tell you at low tide, you can see every bit of sand on this inlet. But if you imagine a foot of water's come in, there's less. You wait a little while, there's less, and you can see how much less visible these rocks are in the center. And if you wait a little longer, they're gone. This tide is up. So if with each incremental intervention, you only had one or two points on a zero to 10 scale, that's all you need. Speaking of accumulative effects or effects that grow over time, I wanted to just conclude with my last couple of slides. If opioid sparing has been on one agenda or another for at least 50 years, why isn't that the default? Well, there is a subcategory of meta-analysis called cumulative meta-analysis that was invented by my friend and colleague Joseph Lau. It led to a lot of acclaim. <coughs> Basically, you repeat the analysis of the effect as each new relevant study becomes available. 
and then you can assess the incremental impact of each study on the previous estimate for the effect. So you can identify a trend towards superiority of active treatment, control, or neither. If you do that retrospectively, you could look at the literature and identify in which year a treatment could have been found to be effective. And if you do it prospectively, you could identify the earliest possible moment to decide when a treatment is effective. Astonishingly, implementation, implementation delays of greater than a decade are common. Let me show you these two diagrams from a New England Journal article. It was a very sentinel article, a very important article. The Lancet uh, gave it the article of the year. What you see here has nothing to do with pain. This is the use of blood thinners or thrombolytic therapy for acute myocardial infarction. As you can see, you have years in the left-hand column. How many randomized control trials studied this? How many patients were cumulatively enrolled? And what's the odds ratio? This looked a little scary when we first heard about this. You're going to give a blood thinner to someone who already has some tissue that may be necrosed. It's very scary. But the initial randomized control trials looked favorable, although there was a wide variance. So then as you go from line to line, what you're doing is adding in the results of each successive randomized controlled trial. And as you can see, as you accumulate more and more patients into the thousands, the variance shrinks and you see emerge the net effect. By the early 1970s, you could have said with a p-value of less than 0.01 that this actually favored the treatment over control. However, why I'm showing this to you is for the right-hand side. What was done by these authors was to say in textbooks or reviews, what were the recommendations? And as you can see, basically this modality was generally not mentioned and that continued into 1990 or it might have been talked about as experimental. But by the early 1970s, there was already enough information to say this works and you should do it. It was not routine or specific recommendation until over a decade later. To the contrary, if you look at prophylactic lidocaine for survival in acute myocardial infarction, this never was found to be beneficial. If anything, it slightly favored the control, but it never achieved statistical significance. What was the general medical practice and teaching? Because it sounded like it was helpful and good. In general, it was mentioned in specific cases, sometimes routine. More and more people mentioned it as routine, even though there was never any evidence for this. So it's quite amazing what will happen. We are now also confronting a whole other dimension. We have shifted to some degree from a dyadic healthcare model where a doctor delivers healthcare to the patient and has outcomes to an expanded perspective where that's true but the patient has social ties and social contacts and there are collateral outcomes. In the United States the public health dialogue is dominated now by considerations about opioids and pain. This just shows the death rates <coughs> starting about a decade ago where there were certain centers where there were elevated death rates, and these increased and grew spatially, just like an epidemic. However, at every level in public health, the rule is unanticipated consequences. So people might argue that the wider distribution and use of opioids was well-intentioned to reduce pain, but had the unanticipated consequence of making opioids more widely available for abuse and misuse. I will get into a moment how the uh, global and blanket efforts to reduce opioid consumption have maybe swung the pendulum the other way. But there are lists of these unanticipated consequences, like building a road will actually encourage people to buy cars, increase traffic, and cause more pollution and congestion. Low tar cigarettes will make people feel comfortable about smoking, but if they increase, they will increase their carcinogen exposure. Uh, antibiotics may treat people, but they'll also select for drug-resistant virulent pathogens. Having highly uh, effective antiviral regimens increases people's behavior that's risky. There's some concern that prescription drug education programs may increase medication misuse amongst teenagers. So I'm assuming you're all medical and won't faint. I'll just, uh, my next to last slide is whether we now have an 
culture of undertreatment. This was a case I was personally familiar with. It happened in September where there was an, an accidental traumatic amputation of the tips of two fingers. This person went to an emergency room with an outstanding hospital and was lucky enough to have an outstanding hand surgeon there on call to be seeing her in 20 minutes. He performed a perfect repair under local anesthesia, then left to go back to the operating room. And so the person said, well, what will I do for pain? They, they said, well, why don't you go to the drugstore and buy some ibuprofen, and if you need it, you can add some acetaminophen or paracetamol, and you'll be fine. And the person said, well, I think this pain is likely to be severe. Do you think I might have something for severe pain? And after much reluctance, the person was given four tablets, or a prescription for four tablets of hydrocodone, five milligrams. And then I won't go into all the details, but outstanding hospital, wonderful culture. So it's often useful to take a quote from a different field. This is the writer and uh, salon uh, host, hostess, Gertrude Stein, who pointed out that everybody gets so much information all day long that they lose their common sense. So the question is, are opioids obsolete? We're going to have a lot of information today, and I apologize for squeezing things in, but it's already done. I'm going to ask our uh, moderators to come up for the next session, which are Esther and Jane. And they'll be merciless in keeping everybody on track and target. We have two coffee breaks, a lunch break, and a reception afterwards. So I thank you very much for your attention. And Bob Cohen deserves a special sound out for being an excellent editor of the newsletter and our media person. So we're separately recording this so that our sound quality will be better than what we had archived for Buenos Aires. So thank you, Bob. And Thank you, Esther, and thank you, Jane.